despite what a lot of people say, I'm not actually a vampire. Yeah, um, you didn't rescue the dragon or anything I, like I that. I didn't find a, a dragon. Nick Cave understands the contradictions at the heart of rock and roll. This is why for my money, he is both a true rock and roll star, but also an iconoclast of the genre. He is probably one of the finest lyricists working in popular music today. More importantly, in 2015, he has delivered a heavyweight literary statement in the form of the Sick Bag Song, his new book published by Canongate this spring. Nick, good to meet you. Hi. Oh, yeah. The Sick Bag Song is a road poem slash horror story. Think uh, The Hitcher meets The Book of Psalms, meets John Berryman, meets a bit of Indianismo, meets uh, The Wasteland, meets uh, Cocksucker Blues, meets Nosferatu, meets Marilyn Monroe, Jimi Hendrix, and Janis Joplin, and anyone else who's drowned in their own sick. The Sick Bag Song it's a Ron Seal title. It does what it says on the tin. It is uh, a song, or maybe you would say an epic poem written on sick bags. Do you want to tell us where this idea came from? It basically happened because I was involved in a kind of experiment. If I actually stated something out loud with enough conviction, uh, it might come true. And I was having trouble writing some songs, and I thought on this American tour, which was 22 dates, I would write 10 songs. And so I was on the plane going to Nashville and uh, I thought, fuck, you know, I've got better start writing these songs. And I didn't have a notebook, so I, st I grabbed a sick bag, as one does, out of the back of the seat and started to write my first song, which I called, for want of a better title, the sick bag song. At some point through five or six sick bags into the exercise, I started to realise I was writing a poem and not a song and that was a huge leap for me because I have always had a terror of writing poetry. Once I'd realised that uh, I was writing a poem and the kind of strictures of writing a, a song, the economy of writing a song was lifted off me, mm -hmm. I started to write a lot. It sort of opened the gates to something uh, that I hadn't done before. The conceit, in a way, is that it's this guy on tour who bears a striking resemblance to myself um, that's kind of musing on all manner of things. On some small level, it's a tour diary because yeah. it goes from town to town, but it's really uh, about other things. With you writing poetry, is this, uh, for want of a better phrase, a leap into the unknown? You know, for me, there was songwriting, which I felt I could do, and I've written hundreds of songs. But poetry was always something up, up there. It was on another, on another level. I felt like I was a kind of an imposter. Uh, I always feel like I'm kind of dabbling in something that I don't really know that much about. This can cause a lot of anxiety, but it also can be quite a freeing. There's a sort of ignorance and naivety about the process of writing something that you're not really supposed to be doing. So the book opens with you as a young boy standing on a bridge facing a very serious dilemma. I was wondering if you could explain what that dilemma was. Is myself as a as a boy, and this is this is a, a true memory as much as memories of these sorts of things can be true. A young boy climbs a riverbank. He steps onto a railway bridge. He is 12 years old. The boy starts to run along the tracks. He arrives in the middle of the bridge. He stands on the edge and looks down at the muddy river below. And this becomes, I guess, a kind of uh, metaphor, I guess, that runs through the, the book about this decision that's made as an artist, whether you uh, are willing to kind of leap into something, leap into the unknown. Very quickly, we realise that it's not a boy. He is the memory of a boy running through the mind of a man in a suite at the Sheraton Hotel in downtown Nashville, Tennessee who is being injected in the thigh with a steroid shot that will transform the jet-lagged, flu-ridden singer into a deity. I think it's important that the book is written on sick bags. It is a look at 
in some ways at the aging process and your own mortality, isn't it? Basically, the sick bag in this, in, in this extended poem becomes this thing that everything gets put into, right? Yeah. So it has a physical representation of the bag, and I'm often looking inside the sick bag, this sick bag that I'm filling up through these 22 dates. And inside the sick bag is everything that I love and loathe, my influences and the people that I, that I kind of worship in a way, uh, the people who've had huge impact on me over the years. Uh, I was interested to see the poet, the revered 20th century poet, John Berryman crop up. And I was wondering to what extent his kind of playful and sometimes quite funny confessional style of poetry has been an influence on you at any time in your career? Well, he's been a huge influence. You know, there's a definite nod to the dream songs. It takes very ordinary things that are happening in his life and articulates them in some way that they become these kind of massive incidences. Basically what I do in songwriting is to take the smallest of instances, of gestures, of, of things that happen that, that, are, that are small and ordinary things and kind of inflating them and making them kind of epic in some way. And the idea of being on tour and having certain anxieties about what's going on at home becomes the kind of engine of this particular book because my wife isn't answering the phone throughout throughout this. When you got to the end of the tour, was, was all you had 22 sick bags? You know, the sick bags are, are basically the kind of notes of that mm. day, but I, I, I actually had started writing the, the poem. I took my kids away into to France somewhere, and, and I was kind of writing it crab-like on the side, pretending I wasn't doing any work. Yeah. But, uh, and a lot of it got done then. So each chapter starts with a bag, a sick bag, and with the notes on it, and then there's the, there's the sort of the, the relevant poem. I spoke to your uh, publisher. He told me that it went through an incredibly intense uh, editing period. I, in my way, I got very excited about the idea of doing this very early on. I, took a photograph of two of these bags, which had a couple of things scribbled on them, and, and kind of sent a, a message to him saying um, that I'm writing this thing, I don't know what it is, it's called the sick bag song, here's two sick bags, will you publish it? And, and Jamie goes, well, writes back going, well, maybe it needs a little developing as an idea before I kind of commit. And I believe there's like a, a very special edition as well. Can you tell us what that is? There is 220 limited edition versions, 10 for each city. It also has a sick bag, which I've written onto and designed, which has taken fucking forever. I've just finished writing a book. I don't want to draw an equivalence, but what I will say about it was I found it one of the most distressing and unpleasant experiences of my life. I wouldn't wish writing a book on my worst enemy, yet you've written three. Do you see yourself doing it again? Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry to hear that, and I'm sure maybe the second one won't be like that. I've always found writing books to be really pleasurable because you, you, you're, you're kind of pursuing one idea. Once you've got the idea, once you've kind of got over the hurdle of what you're going to write, what the fucking thing's going to be about, um, you're kind of off and running, I find. Whether they're any good or not, I don't know, but I've always found the writing of books to be um, something that I've, that I've been able to kind of disappear into. Do you not find it contradictory, the fact that somebody who's so prolific as you seems to spend so much time worrying about inspiration? Songwriting is 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 really fraught with dread. The whole the whole thing, because because there's a sort of history of songwriting, and there's all these songs that are kind of breathing down my neck that I don't want my new songs to be like. For me, the process of being able to continue to work is of absolute importance to me. And there's a kind of complacency that goes with repetition. If you start writing the same thing over and over again, you get complacent, you get bored, and eventually the work suffers. So the anxiety comes about, for me, about finding a new voice each time, or at least finding a new way of saying perhaps the same things. My current favorite from the sick bag pages is 
a jihadist rides a unicorn into a cafe in Jerusalem, or on the actual printed pages. On the next table, a homo antecessor female in sequin Stetson scoops the brains out of her husband's decapitated head. The part of the book that I, that I really enjoyed writing on this was that kind of riff on professional vampirism. The idea that we're all sucking off everybody else, to put it, that's probably not the right way to say it. 26 years previously, you know, we did have another look at uh, the Bad Seeds on tour, but it couldn't have been more different. It was the kind of the, the road film, the road to God knows where. Right. A more cynical young man's look at life on the road. But this couldn't be more different, could it? Uh, road to God knows where, is that what it was called? The Road to God, God knows, knows where. where, yeah. I was basically straight out of rehab mm. on tour. Um, so it was a fucking nightmare. Yeah. Um, on, uh, you, you agreeing with me like you've had some experience in this, uh, which I'm sure you have. But it was suddenly I was uh, not drinking and I wasn't taking drugs and I was on the fucking tour of America. Things are different for me now. F first of all, I enjoy going on tour a lot more these days than maybe I used to, especially in America, that feel like a wholly different thing than we've done, than I think that, that we've ever done. Mostly because a lot of uh, younger people, I guess, bought this last record for some reason, God knows why, but they did. They don't give a fuck about Tupelo and the mercy mm, seat and all that yeah. sort of stuff. They just want to hear the new stuff and they, they don't have, uh, they haven't invested anything. And so there's this kind of excitement that's going on um, that's changing the bad seeds in a, in a very profound way. Quite wisely, you know, you don't invite people into your house to see the real Nick Cave at home, washing the car or doing the dishes or any of that stuff. Am I well, I don't do that. Yeah, well, of course not, because you're a vampire who keeps dragons. Like any, anyone who buys, like, you know, the sick bag song or goes to see 20,000 Days on Earth expecting to see the real you is just kind of like a, you know, either mistaken or an idiot. Has it become easier over the years for you to curate the Nick Cave myth? Is it kind of self-sustaining now? I guess the word myth suggests that it's not real. You know, if you invest enough time and enough attention to something, you become that thing. There's no going back. This kind of idea that someone can come into your house and see behind the mask, I think for a lot of people in my profession, the, the mask just doesn't, uh, just doesn't come off. <laughs> just what it is. There's no, there is nothing behind the mask. A colleague of mine claims that he was working in a bookshop once and you came in and said in a really thunderous way, where do you keep the Bibles? And the more I think about this, <laughs> the more I think about this, the more it cracks me I up. need one. Yeah. Where are they? I think like everyone knows that the, you know, the, the good book has had a maybe profound influence on your life as an artist over the years. I think, you know, there, there was, there's a, for me, there was a lot of beauty in the Bible, but there was a lot of horror too, and this sort of harping voice that goes through the Bible that I found really interesting, of you must do this and you must, you, you should not do that. And I find that kind of bizarre, fucked up instructional text quite in interesting. I mean, it actually looks, it's designed to look like an, a, a uh, sort of instructional manual mm. of some sort. And, and there's a kind of um, riff g going through the book that becomes like part motivational manual or part instructional manual in a similar uh, way to some of the stuff in the Bible, I guess. I think the book is genuinely very deeply touching. Um, does your wife, Susie, like it? Uh, she hadn't read it. Really? <laughs> <laughs> um, you seem to suggest in it that you might get um, flack uh, from her, depending on different things. I was wondering, are you, uh, does, does she pour over your lyrics? No, no, she doesn't, but she's, she's very connected to those songs. Not just that a lot of the songs are about her. She recognises where these songs are coming from, mm. which, is what I'm, which is what I'm talking about. These tiny, ordinary moments between a husband and wife, let's say, that become songs and become much greater, greater things. But she also understands that there's not a lot that goes on between us that I'm not prepared to write about in some kind of way. The, the, the process of writing is so anxiety-ridden, especially about the idea of having nothing to write about, 
that you just got to write about everything that's given to you. You can't kind of pick and choose, I find. Well, I've got to say, it's an absolute pleasure reading this book. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks, Thanks. very much. Roger. Thank you. Mm -hmm.